I value very much the honor to stand before you this morning and to have this time with each of you as we now enter into another segment, the final segment of our track on history. And I wanted to begin with just a few words of gratitude for this congregation, for your elders, and also for your deacons, your members, for everything that goes into putting this event on. It is, uh, in my estimation, uh, been a great success this year, every year just steadily growing. And we're so grateful that we have this opportunity to impact young developing minds and to help them uh, establish them in the truth of God's Word. This morning, as has already been mentioned, we're going to spend some time discussing the historicity of Jesus. And in order to do that properly, we want to begin by understanding what history is. That, of course, in my estimation, is crucial because we cannot begin properly discussing history of anything unless we first tack down the idea of history itself according to the scriptures. Does anybody know what history is? Okay, so we're going to hear constantly the past. Someone over here? Yes, sir? Okay, something that takes time to develop, I think is what I heard. Anyone else? Making a record. A record of what's happened before. So generally speaking, we all understand history to be something of the past. It includes a record. And so when we look at the word itself, history, uh, if you are following along in the notes, you'll see that I gave just a general uh, definition of history from the Oxford English Dictionary. But the basic concept relates to past events. And when most people hear the word history, they take it to mean the study of the past events, particularly in human affairs. Etymologically, the word history comes from several words as it travels through Old French, modern French, into the Greek, and then also the Latin. But we also have the Proto-Indo-European concept that it's attached to. And to make a long thing short, history is actually tied in to two concepts. One is seeing, and the other is research. And so the actual definition, according to the etymology of the word history, it has reference to someone who records what he sees. And then, of course, there is research in confirming what has been seen. And then there is the indication that this is preserved for posterity. But if you look at the notes, I trace the word history all the way back uh, again to its Proto-Indo-European roots that make reference to the idea of to see, to know, and it also makes reference to idea and vision. The reason that's important is because so many of us when we hear the word history, immediately we think about something that someone has recorded. Well, would that not exclude then the beginning of time? Or does it? Let me invite you, and this is just the beginning. We're going to establish a biblical definition of history. But let me invite you into the book of beginnings. And there in the first chapter... We're going to notice something very interesting as we look at the definition of history etymologically as it's tied into the idea of seeing or eyewitness testimony. And this is going to become a pivotal point later as we seek to understand the historicity of Jesus. There is a reason in Genesis chapter 1 that the Bible is sprinkled with the phrase, and God saw. 
You ever wonder why the Bible repeats that phrase about four or five times? If you look at Genesis chapter 1 and verse 4, the Bible says, And God saw the light. It almost seems incidental the way the Bible makes that. I mean, what, what does it matter that God saw the light? Something that he created. You drop down to verse 10, and there the Bible says again that God saw in reference to the waters under the heavens that were gathered together unto one place, and then the appearing of the dry land. And he called that consequently earth, but it says, and God saw this, and it was good. You can follow all the way through and pick up where he sees several things, but at the end of chapter 1, the Bible says, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good, and there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. This makes God the perfect person to relate to us the history of even the universe because it ties into the definition of history itself. You have to have something someone sees and then you have a record of it, albeit the record's going to come sometime later as Moses is revealed these things around 1445 B.C. But as he's revealed these things, it is God who is the witness of these things, as we've already seen, that relates to Moses, and then Moses makes a record of them. And it ties in perfectly with the concept of history. And God saw. We overlook that, but there is a lot to be gained just by way of study when we consider that. Now, what we see with regard to history is the fact that history not only involves seeing and research, as we're going to see here in just a few moments as this lesson develops, but it also distinguishes itself from other popular forms of narrative and prevailing beliefs, such as superstition, myth, fable, fairy tale, folk tale, and legend. And the Bible does make reference to some of these. When you consider Acts chapter 17 and verse 22, there the Bible makes reference to, in the American Standard and in the New King James, it has the word religious, but in the King James it has the word superstitious. And if you understand the definition of superstition, which really makes reference to the fear of, of the unknown, irrational fear of what is unknown or mysterious, especially in connection with religion. And you'll remember the circumstances there in Acts 17 as Paul's at the Areopagus and he addresses that idol that was made in worshiping the unknown God. That is a perfect idea that represents uh, the word superstition or religion in some senses, but you see how that word is used and it's not supposed to be confused with actual history. You also see myth mentioned in the Bible. And myth appears a handful of times in the original form, 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 4, chapter 4 verse 7, 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 4, Titus chapter 1 and verse 14, and 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 16. Only there it appears in the English word fable. But the original word is muthos. It has reference to myth. And so we have to do a little study there to make sure that we understand what the Bible is communicating. And this is the reason why so many confuse the Bible with myth as opposed to history because they do not understand the differences between history and other popular narratives or prevailing beliefs. The essential difference between the two, as we'll see here in just a few moments, is that one is historically verifiable, 
where the others are imaginary. They have no foundation in reality. Uh, so when you look at some of these things, you're going to see, for example, in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 16, if you want to just turn over there so you can see this for yourself. In 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 16 beginning, there the Bible identifies for us this idea of the difference between actual history and other popular forms of narrative and prevailing beliefs. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16 and following, notice how the Bible reads, For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were what? Eyewitnesses of His majesty. Notice the contrast between cunningly devised fables. Again, the word there is muthos. And then eyewitness of his majesty. The difference there is one began in sophistry, whereas the other is actual historical evidence because it's based upon what someone saw. It was then confirmed and recorded. And we'll see how all this comes together. If you continue to read through, it's going to take us to that episode in Jesus' life that we refer to as the transfiguration. And I might add this while we're thinking about that. Uh, the three that were there in the transfiguration, who were they? Peter James, and John. Peter, James, and John. That's significant because later those who seemed to be somewhat pillars of the church, Galatians 2.9, they were the ones that Paul had communications with as he was establishing his apostleship and what God had revealed to him through Jesus and the Spirit. And the Bible says that those brethren, when he met them, eventually as things were explained and proven, confirmed, the Apostle Paul demonstrates that what he received from Jesus is the very thing that they had been preaching. But we'll see how all that develops. But as you keep, as you keep going through 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16, all the way through the end, Eventually, in verse 19, here the Apostle Peter says, And we have the word of prophecy made more sure, whereunto you do well that ye take heed as unto a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Notice, the word of prophecy has been confirmed is the way that should be understood. So that speaks to the definition of history, seeing Recording, confirming, as opposed to irrational fear and as opposed to with regard to uh, the concept of fable, a short tale to teach a moral lesson, often with animals or inanimate objects as characters. Now, I want to caution everyone here because the Bible does use a type of uh, presentation of God's Word that some consider to be fable. It's more close, closer represented as parable. But you have uh, Jotham in Judges 9, 8 through 15, and then also you have uh, uh, jo Joash's answer to Amaziah in 2 Kings 14, 9. Those lean more towards parable, although they're represented as fable. So we want to be sure that we don't confuse ourselves with regard to that. But then you have fairy tale, folk tale, legend, all of these things uh, the Bible does identify and it helps us to make a very clean distinction between what history is actually and all these other things that people are claiming against Jesus. So now that we have a good definition established, I want you to remember history has reference to what is seen, recorded, and then confirmed. We want to talk a little bit now about the Bible itself as history. Well, what does the Bible record? What is it attempting to establish? I submit to you that in this discussion as we focus on Jesus, he being the focal point, 
And really this entire development conference is a discussion about Jesus, who art thou, Lord? But Jesus, of course, represents something greater. I submit to each of us this morning that the Bible is a historical record of the work of the Godhead and what they want to establish among, of course, their conscious creation. So in the beginning, you have, in Genesis chapter 1, emphasis on the Godhead working in creation. You'll see that because if you look at all the terms for God in Genesis 1, you'll see Elohim mentioned several times, which makes reference to the Godhead. You can confirm that by looking at other scriptures where it demonstrates that the Father was working through His Word that later became flesh and also His Spirit. You can uh, cross-reference Genesis 1-1 with John 1-1, and then you can read all the way through verse 4 and see how the Father created through the Word. The Spirit is also mentioned in Genesis 1-3, hovering. He's the principle of life. You can begin to see His work as He was sent not only to give life, but also to explain uh, the idea of God. But there is a subtle shift in Genesis 1 and 2. And in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, you have Elohim all the way through. It's not until Genesis chapter 2 and verse 4 that the Bible begins to make reference to the Lord God or Jehovah God. And there's a subtle shift between the work of the Godhead and then, of course, you have the work of the Father as He continues to work through His Son and through His Spirit. But the entire Bible is a record of the work of God, and it records all of this so that you and I can understand what is taking place. So the Bible teaches us in uh, passages like uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 8. If you'll notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, for a good summary statement of what the Bible says about the work of God or the work of the Godhead. Uh, you'll see there with some interest how it helps us to identify exactly what God is attempting to do. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 4 through 6, the Bible uh, makes reference there. Concerning, therefore, the eating of things sacrificed to idols, we know that no idol is anything in the world, and that there is no God but one. For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are gods many and lords many, yet to us there is one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we unto Him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and we through Him." Notice, of whom and through whom, the reason I mention this is because it helps us to keep the distinction between history and myth, superstition, fable, folklore, and all of that. Why? Because all of that is steeped in the idea of false gods and uh, their supposed existence among people who were relaying these things at that time. But the Bible is very clear. There's one God working through His Son. And notice how it emphasizes of and through. You go back uh, to 1 Corinthians, or go forward rather, to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and you notice there in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 through 6, the different duties that the Godhead had as they were working in the lives of individuals. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit, and there are diversities of ministrations and the same Lord, and there are diversities of workings, but the same God who worketh all things in all. Notice every member of the Godhead mentioned here, God the Father as the overseer, God the Son as the establisher of administrations, and then God the Spirit within the context as the giver of gifts. Uh, this is in a miraculous context, but I would submit for your consideration that here 
though we're no longer under the miraculous system, the Holy Spirit still works in providing spiritual characteristics or traits. The nine gifts mentioned here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 are also uh, as, a, as a counter to the non-miraculous, you'll see nine traits in Galatians chapter 5. Nine miraculous gifts, nine spiritual traits, both coming from the Holy Spirit only through different means. So when you go back and you look at the Bible and you want to see what does the Bible record, it's going to record the history of the work of God. In Psalm 145 then, Psalm 145, noticing there what the Bible says around verse 6, you're going to see then how the Bible describes itself. In Psalm 145, noticing there, uh, well, verse, really, you can read all the way back up uh, in verse 3, beginning, Great is Jehovah and greatly to be praised, and His greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall laud thy works to another, and shall declare thy mighty acts of the glorious majesty of thine honor and of thy wondrous works will I meditate, and men shall speak of the mighty acts of thy terrible acts, and I will declare thy greatness. And so you see there how the history aspect is mentioned when you have one generation to another generation revealing the wonderful works of God. And I submit to each of us that this is God in total, the work of the Godhead. And so when we talk about the historicity of Jesus, then we have to spend some time thinking about what Jesus came to reveal. He came to reveal salvation that was going to be given to mankind. This was also going to be a confirmation of God and then also bringing in the Holy Spirit as all of this rounded out. So we see then that the Bible becomes, of course, the actual historical document that we want to depend upon. Uh, so many people, when they present a lesson on the historicity of Jesus, you'll have them talk about uh, Josephus or Tacitus or some other extra-biblical historians. I submit to each of us, we have enough right here. Uh, once the Bible is established as uh, the most decorated, the most celebrated, the most authenticated record of human history, we have enough in Scripture, the Bible itself, to prove that Jesus was an actual historical figure of the first century. And you can distinguish in Scripture, again, from what is actual history and what is myth, because the Bible warns us on various pages concerning that. I might remind all of us, and many of us know this, and we have uh, heard this several times already, but you remember in Scripture the great emphasis on God recording His Word. And even in the picture of God giving us the Ten Commandments, uh, remember there the Bible says He wrote these things with His finger. And when you look at that, you'll see that God was always emphasizing a record of His Word. And then, of course, that goes all throughout uh, history according to the Bible into the New Testament and even after the New Testament was finished and established. So as we look at this, there are a lot of, there's a lot of information that I gave concerning the Bible as proof uh, of the historicity of Jesus. I'll leave it to you to study that on your own because there's just too much information uh, to take from here. But what I wanted to do is spend some time on the greatest evidence for the historicity of Jesus in my estimation, and that's going to come from the conversion of the Apostle Paul as recorded in the New Testament. When you look at the conversion of the Apostle Paul, you're going to see if we begin with A.D. 30 or 33, uh, the death and the establishment of the church with regard to Jesus, and then about three to six years after that, 
you have historically uh, Saul, who later became Paul, being converted by Jesus himself. And everything that goes along with that. But in the scriptures, we have some very detailed things that we don't want to miss that help us to understand and prove that Jesus was an actual historical figure. First of all, with regard to the Apostle Paul, we're going to see several things about him. We're going to see, according to Acts 22 and verse 14, that he came by the will of the Father through Jesus Christ. We also see that Jesus converted the Apostle Paul by revelation of the gospel. That's Galatians chapter 1, verse 11 and 12. He did use the scriptures, as, the, as Paul himself references in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. And then you can compare that to Luke 24, 27 and 32. And then, of course, later Paul does confirm his apostleship Galatians 1.1, 1, 1, 2 Timothy 1.11, uh, and others actually established that. The Apostle Paul identifies, according to Acts 13.9, or, or excuse me, uh, according to Acts 22.28, uh, that he was a Roman citizen by birthright. He did study at the feet of Gamaliel in Jerusalem, Acts 22.3. According to Philippians 3.5 through 6, the Bible says there that he was of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as touching the law, he was a Pharisee, as touching zeal, persecuting the church, as touching the righteousness which is in the law, which, be, which would make reference to the Mosaic law, he was found blameless. So all of these things, as we bring them into focus and we see who Saul or Paul was, we're going to see something amazing about his conversion. Uh, his conversion happens around A.D. 32 to 33. Again, depending on where you begin, A.D. 30 or 33. We're talking about uh, anywhere from two to six years. And those who study history tell us the closer you can get to the original source, the better, because it limits the possibility of mistakes. But do you remember what happens in Acts 9, 4 through 5, and also in chapter 22, 7 through 8, when Jesus reveals himself to Saul and initiates his conversion, what question does Saul ask? Who art thou, Lord? And that's, of course, the question that ultimately we're going to ask as we go out and evangelize and help people to come to terms with what God wants them to come to terms with. Jesus is sent in order to elicit the question from each of us, who art thou? And then, of course, Jesus is going to redirect to the Father, and there is the Spirit working behind the scenes, helping all of this to unfold. But as you continue to move forward, and you look at the Apostle Paul, you're going to see as soon as Paul was converted. The Bible says in Acts 9.19 that he spent certain days with the disciples who were at Damascus. What was he doing? Well, we could, uh, I guess, safely infer that he was continuing to discuss his conversion. Maybe he was discussing Jesus and wanted to inquire more about who Jesus was. Sometime after that, if you look at the timeline of Saul or Paul's conversion, you're going to see that he travels to Arabia, and he remains there certain days, Galatians 1.17. After that, he returns to Damascus and then has to exit the city for safety. But we also know, according to Acts 9, 20 through 22, that after some time, as the apostle Paul, as he's eventually known, as he comes to the information concerning the gospel through research, he begins to do what? He preaches Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God, and he increased the more in strength, the Bible says, and confounded the Jews that dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is the Christ. What's the first thing the Apostle Paul did once he was converted? He made sure that what he was taught was accurate, he confirmed it, then he went out and in essence he began to share with other people 
how we know Jesus was who he said he was. That, of course, is in reference to the historicity of Jesus. What's amazing about all of this is when you look at what Paul did, turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 1 and verse 18. You're going to see, as this is connected back to the idea of the concept of history. In Galatians chapter 1 and verse 18, notice what the Bible there says. If someone would lift up their voice and read that for us, please. Galatians 1, 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them. Galatians. First wow. Galatians 1, 18. I That's okay. Three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. Does anybody see the word history there? No, sir. Remember how we began. The definition of history etymologically traces its roots all the way back to see. I submit to you that the word see there translates the word historial. So when the Bible says that Paul went to go see Cephas, he was already performing the actions of a historian. And it's all captured in the word see. You don't get that from the English. You get that through research. And this is the only time the word historio is used in all of the Bible. And it gives us eventually the English word history. So the Apostle Paul as he was converted by Jesus, he then spoke to brethren. They were no doubt teaching him, encouraging him. Then eventually he wanted to broaden his horizons. He went to go see the apostles and the Lord's brother. It's all right there in the word see. He was playing the role of a historian. But remember, as I made reference to, from the Greek, the word historio gives us the word historia, which means information based on research. So what the apostle Paul was doing was he was researching the scriptures as we would understand it. He was researching the word that God had given to several to make sure that what he was taught was accurate. And it's all right there in the little word see. I went to see in the American Standard. It's, it does an injustice. I, I love the American Standard, but I, I hated when I saw that it used the word visit here. It should be the word see because it ties into the concept of history. But on top of that, if you jump over to chapter 2 and you see how the Bible begins to help us to understand the conversion of Saul or Paul. In Galatians 2 and 2, it says, I went up by revelation and I laid before them the gospel which I preached among the Gentiles, but privately before them who were of repute, lest by any means I should be running or had run in vain. What does that mean? That means that the apostle Paul shared with those who were of repute. This would be, later we're going to see, that this is Peter, James, and John. But he shares with them what Jesus gave him in order to make sure that what he is preaching is consistent with what they have been preaching. And he wants to establish unity, even though it came from two different sources with regard to the time period. Because Jesus obviously is the one who taught Peter, James, and John. He did that uh, in a manner that was different than he taught the Apostle Paul. Although you have two different time periods, uh, you have the same source, and you have the same thing being taught, and Peter now, or the Apostle Paul rather now, is confirming it to make sure that everything is accurate. You continue reading through this and you're going to see 
what the Bible says eventually when you come to uh, verse 7. But contrawise, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel of the uncircumcision, even as Peter with the gospel of the circumcision, for he that wrought for Peter unto the apostleship of the circumcision wrought for me also unto the Gentiles. And when they perceived the grace that was given unto me, James and Cephas and John, they who were reputed to be pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, that we should go unto the Gentiles, and they unto the circumcision. Here is the point. If you go back up, you're going to see how the Bible emphasizes with regard to uh, those who were um, who were apostles before him, who were in the leadership before him, it says, they imparted to me nothing. Which means that when Jesus revealed these things to the apostle Paul, he confirmed them separately from the apostles. It wasn't until later that he came and then confirmed that they were all teaching and preaching the same thing. I submit to each of us this uh, morning, afternoon, that the Apostle Paul stands as a model then for what you and I ought to do as we go out and evangelize. We're supposed to go out and help people to understand the same thing that Jesus helped Paul understand. And then we're supposed to do what Paul did. He went and he made sure that what he was taught was accurate. He made sure to confirm it. And then he established unity among other brethren who were already doing the same thing. So then, as we look at this, we see then that the Bible as a historical document becomes a means by which God has given us to confirm truth. The Bible then is a document that helps us to dispel misinformation and disinformation. And right now we are under a great attack with regard to that. I mentioned a little, a little bit of this in the postmodern discussion, but we have a little time to talk about this now. The Bible helps us to understand the truth, not only its origin, but its uh, essentiality, and then of course how God continues to work through the truth. And today our battle lies in people or, or against people who fail to take the time to really research things, to confirm things, and then you have people teaching and saying things that are not accurate. So when you look at this, the Bible from beginning to end helps us to understand precision is what God requires from each of his people. It's not enough to claim to know. It's not enough to be able to regurgitate facts and figures and all of that. That was the problem in the first century among various brethren. They were merely rehearsing things, but the examples that we get from, from the Apostle Paul and others is everything has to be verified. Everything has to be researched. Everything has to be confirmed. Why? because we have a formidable enemy in Satan. And his work is to divide us. And the way he's going to divide us is in the different thoughts that we have. I was telling someone the other day, uh, I'm a little leery sometimes in, in presenting myself in this type of situation because over the years I see that there's more of a breeding of competition rather than a coming together and promoting unity. Uh, brethren, we're not in competition. We're supposed to be one. We're supposed to be upholding each other. And obviously we're going to have differences here and there. But at the end of the day, I want us to be together fighting for the same cause. And, and we have people, even, even of our own, outside that are trying to divide us saying different things about different people. 
That's all the work of God, uh, the work of Satan, and God is 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 uh, attempting to help us to understand, especially with regard to the historicity of Jesus, that these things ought not so to be. If we can understand that Jesus was an actual historical figure that lived in the first century and everything that's along with that, then we ought to be able to verify and confirm the various things that we believe and teach, making sure that we're united because that's when we're going to be the strongest, when we're united teaching those things the way God wants us to teach them. I want to I want it off with this. I have just a few minutes. If you look at the New Testament, you're going to see how this was the case, especially from Luke's perspective. In the book of Luke, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, notice how the Bible reveals this. In Luke chapter 1, 1 through 4, many of you know as these things have been brought out, but the Bible says here that Luke uh, drew up a narrative concerning those matters which have been fulfilled among us. Notice reference to a story about events that were no doubt seen, and we don't have to conjecture about that because then in verse 2 it says, who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. So here is a narrative based upon eyewitness testimony, and then follow it all the way through because he says in verse 3 that he's trying to Strive for precision, accuracy. But then at the end, what is it all for? That thou mightest know the certainty concerning those things wherein thou wast instructed. Don't gloss over the word instructed there. Because that has reference to the idea that we have been referencing throughout this entire class. And that is, once you're given the story that's based on eyewitness testimony that we are striving to confirm for accuracy, then as it is confirmed, we allow it to instruct us so that we can instruct others. And that, my friends, is what the Bible says concerning the process by which we come to terms with what God is attempting to do. The answer to the question, was Jesus an actual historical figure of the first century, is a resounding yes. How do we know it? Because the Bible teaches us that that is the case. And we can prove, as we've already done somewhat, that to be the case. Now it's up to us to go out and to share with others these things that we have discovered and help them to do likewise. Thank you for your time and your attention.